You think that you are the mind. The mind is nothing but thoughts. Now behind every particular thought, there is a general thought, which is the I, that is yourself. Let us call this I the first thought. Stick to this I thought and question it to find out what it is. When this question takes strong hold on you, you cannot think of other thoughts. What happens when you make a serious quest for the self is that the I thought disappears and something else from the depths takes hold of you. And that is not the I which commenced the quest. That is the real self, the import of I. It is not the ego. It is the supreme being itself. I do not say that you must go on rejecting thoughts forever. Cling to yourself, that is, to the I thought. When your interest keeps you to that single idea, other thoughts will automatically get rejected and they will vanish. Rejection of thoughts may only be necessary for a time or for some. You fancy that there is no end if one goes on rejecting every thought when it rises. It is not true there is an end. If you are vigilant and make a stern effort to reject every thought when it rises, you will soon find that you are going deeper and deeper into your own inner self. At that level, it is not necessary to make an effort to reject thoughts. Not only that, it is impossible for you to make an effort beyond a certain extent. Now it is impossible for you to be without effort. When you go deeper, it is impossible for you to make any effort. If the mind becomes introverted through inquiry into the source of the I thought, the vasanas become extinct. The light of the self falls on the vasanas and produces the phenomenon of reflection we call the mind. 
Thus, when the vasanas become extinct, the mind also disappears, being absorbed into the light of the one reality, the heart. This is the sum and substance of all that an aspirant needs to know. What is imperatively required of them is an earnest and one-pointed inquiry into the source of the I thought. The mind will subside only by means of the inquiry, who am I? The thought, who am I, destroying all other thoughts, will itself finally be destroyed, like the stick used for stirring the funeral pyre. If other thoughts rise, one should, without attempting to complete them, inquire, to whom did they rise? What does it matter how many thoughts rise? At the very moment that each thought rises, if one vigilantly inquires, To whom did this thought rise? It will be known to me. If one then inquires, who am I? The mind will turn back to its source, the self. And the thought which had risen will also subside. By repeatedly practicing thus, the power of the mind to abide in its source increases. Although tendencies towards sense objects which have been recurring down the ages, rise in countless numbers like the waves of the ocean. They will all perish as meditation on one's nature becomes more and more intense. Without giving room even to the doubting thought, is it possible to destroy all these tendencies and to remain as self alone? One should persistently cling fast to self attention. A 
as long as there are tendencies towards sense objects in the mind. The inquiry, who am I, is necessary. As and when thoughts rise, one should annihilate all of them through inquiry then and there in their very place of origin. Not attending to what is other is non-attachment or desirelessness. Not leaving self is knowledge, jnana. In truth, these two, desirelessness and knowledge, are one and the same. Just as the pearl diver, tying a stone to his waist, dives into the sea and takes the pearl lying at the bottom. So everyone, diving deep within themselves, with non-attachment, can attain the pearl of self. If one resorts uninterruptedly to remembrance of one's real nature, until one attains self, that alone will be sufficient. Inquiring, who am I that is in bondage? And knowing one's real nature alone is liberation. Always keeping the mind fixed in self alone is called self-inquiry. Whereas meditation is thinking oneself to be the absolute, which is existence, consciousness, bliss. Your current life of action need not be renounced. If you meditate for an hour or two every day, you can then carry on with your duties. If you meditate in the right manner, then the current of mind induced will continue to flow even in the midst of your work. It is as though there were two ways of expressing the same idea. The same line which you take in meditation will be expressed in your activities. The results of doing that will be that you will find 
that your attitude towards people, events and objects gradually changes. Your actions will tend to follow your meditations of their own accord. One should therefore surrender the personal selfishness which binds one to this world. Giving up the false self is the true renunciation. There is no conflict between work and wisdom. if it's possible for one to continue all the old activities in one's profession and at the same time get enlightenment. Why not? But in that case, one will not think that it is the old personality which is doing the work because one's consciousness will gradually become transferred until it is centered in that which is beyond the little self. Setting apart time for meditation is only for the merest spiritual novices person who is advancing will begin to enjoy the deeper beatitude whether they are at work or not. While their hands are in society, they keep their head cool in solitude. tries to drive their mind to the goal, as a cowherd drives a bull with a stick. But on this path of self-inquiry, the seeker coaxes the bull by holding out a handful of grass. have to ask yourself the question, who am I? This investigation will lead in the end to the discovery of something within you which is behind the mind. Solve that great problem and you will solve all other problems.
You say that in seeking the eye, there is nothing to be seen. But because you are accustomed to identify yourself with the body and sight with the eyes, therefore you say you do not see anything. What is there to be seen? Who is to see? How to see? There is only one consciousness which manifesting as I thought identifies itself with the body, projects itself through the eyes and sees the objects around. The individual is limited in the waking state and expects to see something different. The evidence of their senses will be the seal of authority. But they will not admit that the seer, the seen, and the seeing are all manifestations of the same consciousness, namely, I, I. Contemplation helps one to overcome the illusion that the self must be visual. In truth, there is nothing visual. How do you feel the eye now? Do you hold a mirror before you to know your own being? The awareness is the eye. Realize it and that is the truth. The perception of I is associated with a form, maybe the body, but there should be nothing associated with the pure self. The self is the unassociated, pure reality, in whose light the body and the ego shine. On stilling all thoughts, the pure consciousness remains. Just on waking from sleep, 
and before becoming aware of the world, there is that pure I, I. Hold on to it without sleeping or without allowing thoughts to possess you. If that is held firm, it does not matter even if the world is seen. The seer remains unaffected by the phenomena. What is the ego? Inquire. The body is insentient and cannot say I. The self is pure consciousness and non-dual. It cannot say I. No one says I in sleep. What is the ego then? It is something intermediate between the inert body and the self. It has no locus standi. If sought for, it vanishes like a ghost. At night, a man may imagine that there is a ghost by his side because of the play of shadows. If he looks closely, he discovers that the ghost is not really there and what he imagined to be a ghost was merely a tree or a post. If he does not look closely, the ghost may terrify him. All that is required is to look closely and the ghost vanishes. The ghost was never there. So also with the ego. It is an intangible link between the body and pure consciousness. It is not real. So long as one does not look closely at it, it continues to give trouble. But when one looks for it, it is found not to exist. Persist in the inquiry throughout your waking hours. That will be quite enough. If you keep on making the inquiry till you fall asleep, the inquiry will go on during sleep also. Take up the inquiry again as soon as you wake up.
peace is your natural state. It is the mind that obstructs the natural state. If you do not experience peace, it means that your inquiry has been made only in the mind. Investigate what the mind is and it will disappear. There is no such thing as mind apart from thought. Nevertheless, because of the emergence of thought, you surmise something from which it starts and term that the mind. But when you probe to see what it is, you find there is really no such thing as mind. When the mind has thus vanished, you realize eternal peace. stillness of mind which is blank and empty does not mean salvation. Such a condition is termed manolaya or temporary stillness of thought. Manolaya means concentration temporarily arresting the movement of thoughts. As soon as this concentration ceases, thoughts, old and new, rush in as usual. And even if this temporary lulling of mind should last a thousand years, it will never lead to total destruction of thought. which is what is called liberation from birth and death. The practitioner must therefore be ever on the alert and inquire within as to who has this experience, who realizes its pleasantness. Without this inquiry, he will go into a long trance or deep sleep. Due to the absence of a proper guide at this stage of spiritual practice, many have been deluded and fallen a prey to a false sense of liberation and only a few have managed to reach the goal safely.
The following story illustrates the point very well. A yogi was doing penance for a number of years on the banks of the Ganges. When he had attained a high degree of concentration, he believed that continuance in that stage for prolonged periods constituted liberation and practiced it. One day, before going into deep concentration, he felt thirsty and called to his disciple to bring a little drinking water from the Ganges. But before the disciple arrived with the water, he'd gone into yogic sleep and remained in that state for countless years, during which time much water flowed under the bridge. When he woke up from this experience, he immediately called, Water, water. But there was neither his disciple, nor the Ganges in sight. The first thing which he asked for was water because before going into deep concentration, the topmost layer of thought in his mind was water. And by concentration, however deep and prolonged it might have been, he had only been able to temporarily lull his thoughts. When he regained consciousness, this topmost thought flew up with all the speed and force of a flood breaking through the dikes. If this is the case with regard to a thought which took shape immediately before he sat for meditation, there is no doubt that thoughts which took root earlier would also remain unannihilated. If annihilation of thoughts is liberation, can he be said to have attained salvation? Seekers rarely understand the difference between this temporary stilling of the mind and permanent destruction of thoughts. In the temporary stilling of the mind, there is a temporary subsistence of thought waves and though this temporary period may even last for a thousand years, thoughts, which are thus temporarily stilled, rise up as soon as the concentration ceases. One must therefore watch one's spiritual progress carefully. One must not allow oneself to be overtaken by such spells of stillness of thought. The moment one experiences this, one must revive consciousness and inquire within as to who it is who experiences this stillness. While not allowing any thoughts to intrude, one must not, at the same time, 
be overtaken by this deep sleep or self-hypnotism. Though this is a sign of progress towards the goal, yet it is also the point where the divergence between the road to liberation and yoga nidra takes place. way, the direct way, the shortest cut to salvation is the inquiry method. By such inquiry, you will drive the thought force deeper till it reaches its source and merges therein. It is then that you will have the response from within and find that you rest there, destroying all thoughts once and for all. <laughs> 